Hello, everybody. My name is Asan Masood. I'm uh, Nature's Editorials Editor, and I look after our news coverage of Africa and the Middle East. I am delighted uh, to be uh, moderating and chairing this discussion, uh, which is on a, an incredibly timely topic on science, evidence, and government reflections on the uh, on the COVID-19 experience. I'm just going to very briefly introduce our panel. Um, we have Professor Dame Teresa Marteau, who's the director of the Behavioral and Health Research Unit at uh, Christ College. Uh, we've got Professor Sir David Spiegelhalter, who's the chair of the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence. Uh, Professor Anna Vignoles, who's at the Faculty of Education and co-chair of the Center for Data-Driven Discovery, also here at Cambridge. And Professor Neil Lawrence, who's the DeepMind Professor of Machine Learning. I, I, I put one question to each of our panelists, same question to each of our panelists, just to start us off, um, and then we're going to go into into more of a into a discussion about some of the themes, and then hopefully we will then open that up for Q and A. The very first question that I've asked everyone, um, and I'm just going to go in the order that I can see um, uh, on on the screen. The first question really was, um, is, is if each of our panelists could please explain how you've been working with government, with Parliament, including the devolved assemblies. Um, and the media on the current COVID pandemic. What's been your role? What have you been doing? Uh, Anna, can you start us off, please? I can reach my mute button after all this time. I should have that covered, shouldn't I? Um, so thank you very much for inviting me on, on this panel. Um, I am an educationalist, but I'm also an economist. And most of my day job is looking at education inequalities. But during the pandemic, of course, we've been focused on trying to think about what uh, our response to uh, COVID-19 might mean in terms of um, education experience, education achievement and such like. Um, I've been working with the Royal Society Delve Initiative, um, led by Neil Lawrence, also on this panel, um, and trying to work out what it is, not just um, that we think uh, government might do sort of in the short term, but also thinking about the long term consequences of our response to the virus. Um, and uh, the thing I think that's been really interesting is that we in education have always been aware that uh, we have stark education inequalities um, and that it's very difficult to tackle them at the best of times. And this negative impact, negative shock from COVID is likely to worsen that substantially. But I think what the work we've done with the Royal Society really illustrates is the benefit of tackling that issue and thinking about that issue in very deep ways in an interdisciplinary manner. Um, and so what I would say is that when we came together as a team, we were in epidemiologists, statisticians, educationalists, economists, trying to work together to figure out, you know, what will COVID-19 do for the you know, academic achievement of school children and also other aspects of their lives, including their mental health and how might we tackle it. And I think one of the things I would observe um, through COVID-19 and our response to that is that um, we have a lot of information. We have an awful lot of data. We've been bombarded with it. But much of the insights that we, we get in that data are very uh, one dimensional. They're coming from one particularly disciplinary uh, perspective. Um, I think what's really important is that when we're tackling issues, uh, we're tackling the same issue, but from lots of different perspectives, and we have to do that together. It's not enough to have papers from a number of different disciplines on the same topic. It's actually you've got to thrash through the problems, uh, both in terms of sort of what research tells you, but also how that might be delivered on the ground. Um, so it's been really interesting working with that. And of course, as part of that Delve initiative, we've also been thinking about um, you know, how to handle that in the media. And in particular, I think what we spent a lot of time doing is trying to avoid this sort of dichotomy between you're either in favor of locking down and, and from a sort of medical perspective, or you're shutting down the economy and that's bad. Um, and, and that this debate being dichotomous has been really unhelpful. And that's really, really obvious in the field of education where there are lots of things coming to bear. So that's been uh, a really interesting aspect. And um, our report was, I think, well received and indeed went into SAGE. And I'm sure we'll come on later to how uh, you know SAGE has been working and, and what SAGE has been doing with the kinds of information that we've been feeding in. Thank you. That's fascinating. Loads of things I'm sure that we're going to come back to. Thank you so much. Um, Teresa, can you start us off, please? What have you been doing? How have you been working with all the various actors and stakeholders in the pandemic? 
Yes, um, <clears throat> thanks very much. I'm a behavioral scientist and I was invited to participate in uh, one of the subgroups of SAGE at the end of March. Um, and that's the uh, SPY-B, which is um, the behavioral science subgroup. I've also uh, been a regular participant in the environmental working group or modeling group. Uh, it's got uh, two different names um, and occasionally attended uh, the main SAGE if I've been leading on a particular paper. So um, been there for discussion. And I've also taken part in numerous uh, task and finish groups in different government departments. So um, I, I haven't totted up the hours, but um, uh, it's, it's been uh, a, a night job uh, <laughs> that I've taken on since March and continue to, to, to do so. So what I uh, say mainly what I've been working on is, you know, it's a huge, huge team science effort, um, working on different papers, um, bringing together, summarizing evidence, direct and indirect evidence, because prior to the pandemic, there was often very little evidence on um, how to reduce transmission of uh, this virus or other respiratory viruses um, through intervention. So looking at uh, behavior of people in public spaces, in large events, um, how people respond to testing have just been some of the things that I've been looking at. You asked the question about our engagement with the media. Um, I made a decision that I feel um, very comfortable about um, uh, as I uh, agreed to start participating in SAGE, which was not to do any media work uh, at all, unless it related to a paper um, on which I was an author or, um, yeah, uh, say a scientific publication, or if I felt that there was an important part of behavioral science um, that needed to be communicated uh, in the public domain. Um, and I felt very strongly and, and, and do feel very strongly that uh, being a participant in a cross stage is very much part of being a team, a huge team led um, valiantly by Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty. And I just didn't want to do, or and continue not to want to do anything that might distract or take away from this extraordinary hand that they've been dealt. Um, I've watched various colleagues, some of them uh, on, on this panel, who've been absolutely brilliant. Um, but I've also watched other colleagues who have been, uh, their message has been politicized. Um, sometimes uh, they've uh, unwittingly, uh, and other times people have taken the opportunity and strayed beyond their science to start giving their personal views and venting their personal frustrations, which uh, I've uh, saved for my friends rather than uh, the airwaves. <clears throat> well, well, we're among friends now, I hope anyway. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Um, next, I've got Neil. Neil, what, how have you been working during the pandemic? So um, I got involved in convening the group that um, Anna mentioned earlier. Uh, sort of early on, I think, uh, well, a long time ago, wasn't it? Probably late March. There was a sense, I think, that um, perhaps needed. Uh, there was interest in bringing a group together that was working uh, around data, and that became uh, the Delve group that was convened by the Royal Society. It reported into Sage by the Royal Society's president, uh, Venki Ramakrishnan, and uh, it it had a structure that I helped put together where there was a core team, uh, an action team, as we called it, that was doing work on data analytics and stuff. Um, and also pulling people together for specific reports. So there's a number of reports. There's Anna, one that Anna was uh, leading with Simon Burgess on schools, but we ranged across a number of areas, including economics and uh, face masks and uh, uh, vaccines was a recent one. And I'm definitely missing one of the reports there. Um, and the idea was, as Anna sort of highlighted, to have a sort of multidisciplinary group of people around these reports. So. Uh, I, I think I most of the time felt that I was out of my domain of expertise, but um, 
and it was just an amazing pleasure being able to work with all these experts and and, and try and understand what they were sort of saying and, and bring them together um so it it's been an extraordinary experience um, and I'm really excited to also hear uh, the experience of others on the panel. So I'll just stop there. Great stuff. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, and last but not least, uh, David. Yeah, my experience has been almost totally different from the other members of the panel. Um, I haven't had any official role at all. Um, I haven't worked on any working papers for SAGE. I went to one SAGE meeting. Uh, they didn't ask me back. And uh, but I did get managed to get on the Sage website, which still means journalists contact me as, as a member of Sage. Um, what, Teresa? I, I want to correct you, David, um, because your name does appear on one Sage paper where I thank you. Oh, right. I, I, I did check it with you. Yeah, 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 fine. fine. I thank you oh, for yeah. your input when we were estimating the performance of various antibody tests. Yeah. I have chipped in a little bit on some things, I suppose. Um, but um, I, I have had some, you know, uh, teamwork. Uh, I've been ch the chair of the Winton Centre in Cambridge on risk and evidence communication, and they've been doing fantastic work with doing large scale experiments on various ways of com communicating COVID risks to individuals. And uh, they're currently working with NHS Digital on a risk calculator interface. Um, I'm co-chair of the Royal Statistical Society COVID Task Force. And now, oh, I have got an official role. I'm a non-executive director on the UK Statistics Authority, which happened halfway through the, the pandemic, the first wave, and um, which oversees the Office for National Statistics and therefore the um, COVID infection survey. And it also oversees the Office for Statistics Regulation, the ones who write the rude letters to... Uh, uh, to ministers and everybody else saying about the misuse of statistics. And so, for example, I'm, I'm on the group that's um, writing the investigation report for the um, you know, mutant algorithm that uh, got into a bit of a mess with the exams earlier this year. So I have got some official role, but mainly I've been working as an individual, doing the complete opposite of what Teresa said, in that I have been engaging with the media. I have been doing a lot of it trying to explain things and desperately trying, which we'll come back to, I'm sure, not to take sides and trying not to identify with this absurd polarization that's been happening. And I hope we can come back to that. Um, there's uh, enormous demand for, for media work. Um, I've had some, I think, successes, some utter failures, which we might come back to. But for example, you know, at the, during the peak of the epidemic, I was doing a, a weekly press briefing with the Science Media Center with Carl Hennigan, which is interesting, um, on the Tuesday, um, the Tuesday lunchtime after the Office of National Statistics figures came out every week. And so I had a huge amount of media engagement. So that's which carries on. And that's the sort of stuff I've been doing. So I, uh, I have had quite a high profile and my Twitter following has increased nicely. It's good, good for ref impact, presumably. Um. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> communication is always difficult to get the evidence of impact in that's the trouble you can't just quote hard. twitter followers I mean, yeah. yeah well thank you thanks so much uh david thank you everyone else um so the the, the way we're going to do this is i um i've sort of very arbitrarily divided uh, our kind of themes into two um so for the first half we'll talk about the the science advice aspects um of the topic um and then for the second half, we will talk more about the, the communication aspects. So advice, science and research advice into policy, and then uh, in the, the way in which that's been communicated very much um, sort of ripping off uh, from, uh, from what David, from what you've been saying. And then at the end of that, and then we'll kind of bring in the, uh, the questions coming in from, from our participants and attendees. And so really David, st staying with you just to start with, um, how well do you think the Westminster government has approached evidence in its decisions? And how do you think it could have done things differently or better? Oh dear. Um, I mean, I'm the one who hasn't been involved in, in giving advice. So I suppose yeah. as an outsider, I'm supposed, outsider, to, give, yeah, exactly. I'm supposed right to be able to comment on this. Um, yeah, yes. Um, I, I, we're talking about how well the government has done it rather than the sciences. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's got who has ranted in. I've ranted a lot in public about 
the, the use at the beginning of this epidemic, oh, we're following the science or, or this, or we're being guided by the science, because that was so, I think, and now recognized to be very inappropriate. And uh, I really admire the way that Chris Whitty, right from the beginning, and to Patrick, but Chris has been excellent at saying right from the beginning, these, we are just talking about a restricted amount of evidence. We're talking about medical evidence, in particular, we're mainly talking about the COVID evidence, and that any decision that's a policy decision has to be based on a much broader picture. It's got to take into account um, other, as, as you know, Anna will, will talk about in terms of education, must take into account a bigger picture. Um, so I, I was infuriated uh, and, and said so that there was this claim that they were following the science, uh, which seemed to me an attempt to, in a way, shift the blame and responsibility to, um, to SAGE, which in no way could actually um, be considered as the ones who are saying what to do because these are political decisions and these are political responsibilities. Um, so I think that's the first aspect. And that I think has been slightly more recognized, although we'll come on to communications and briefings later, I'm sure, when I can have another rant on about those. Um, I, I don't know if you want me to, I mean, there have obviously been policy mistakes um, and uh, we could go right back into the whole business of the planning and the scenarios and things like that, but that's probably not what you want me to talk about now. Well, no, I mean, um, you know, in, in, in a way, you know, I suppose in a way we sort of do. I mean, what what do you think could oh. now with some with the benefit of hindsight, what, what could they have done? Differently? Yeah, OK, well, I'm, I'm, you know, a big fan of the, let's talk about the National Risk Register, for example, of which I'm a big mm. fan and I have helped work on that before. I, I was on Sage for the volcanic ash, for example, and things like that. Mm. So I, I, I've done my time. Um, and uh, I, I think the uh, National Risk Register, of course, you know, had pandemic flu at the top right hand corner, the most serious and the most likely thing to happen. But emerging infectious diseases was right down in the middle. It's not being, it was because based on the evidence from MERS and SARS was, was down as is most you know, likely or, or the scenario that was part of the risk register um, was actually quite mild, a few hundred deaths and you know, really very unlikely to happen. And so it was quite explicit in terms of the, the planning of civil contingencies that emerging diseases were not being considered as, as a serious threat. Um, within the National Security Risk Register, which was leaked, um, the, the, uh, which also I've worked on, but um, that's you know, it was behind the scenes, of course, um, they, they, um, which does express the uncertainty and the variability around scenarios, emerging diseases was given an enormous range of possibilities and likelihoods. It was given a, a lot more flexibility about what could happen. But that does not seem to have fed through into the actual planning that happened. So um, I... I uh, we could get also onto this use of reasonable worst case scenarios, which I've been arguing about and being for at least 11 years uh, about how the use of those in planning and how that is, uh, I think, can be uh, very inappropriate, um, let alone the communication of them, which is disastrous. Um, we'll, we can come on to that later. But I would say then that in, in terms of the planning, um, the uh, there was, a, in a sense, a failure within the public national risk register of recognizing the, the, the what, what this uh, threat and um, within the secret national security re risk register, again, a failure to take into account the possibility that it could be both fairly likely and very severe indeed. Thank you. Uh, let's come to Teresa. Teresa, would you agree? Um, has there been a failure in the planning? Um, I mean, one thing that we often hear you know, politicians and policymakers say is that um, you scientists, it's all, everything keeps changing. You're always disagreeing with each other. So, you know, it's kind of not surprising that the policy will be one thing one day and then it might be something else the next day. Um, I think I would, I, I don't know that I could comment at such a, a meta level. Um, so- Try, I, try. So, <laughs> you, you're, 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 the, you're the person in the room. I, I, I want to get into the weeds and uh, <laughs> and say that I think it's uh, there's work to be done mapping uh, the advice, uh, let's call it that, the evidence that went from the different groups and, and from SAGE to government and how government responded. And if I had a general comment to make, it would be that um, uh, the action 
uh, it was not fast enough and um, sometimes was too dilute. And one of my, uh, and I do understand why uh, science, scientists advise, uh, governments decide, there's a whole messy bit in the middle. And so just to take one example that, that I was working on and continue to work on, which is um, uh, financial and other support for, for self-isolation, which is absolutely key in this pandemic. And it's been well rehearsed that the levels at which people who are identified as uh, being either contacts or uh, being infected uh, those those levels are low. So it was recommended that there was fine, um, a support package which would include financial support and other key elements of a package. And at the time that that uh, paper went over, government did act uh, that there was an increase in a financial package, but this is many months after it had been raised initially. They also put in fines. And when I read this, I thought, oh my God, I can't believe they've done this. Um, what, do you, what, what, do you mean by, what do you mean by what do you mean by fines? Uh, so if people didn't self-isolate, they could be fined. We were talking about supporting people to self-isolate. Mm. And we had one line in our paper that if you blinked, you'd have missed it. But it did say that um, the evidence suggests that if you introduce uh, fines or other uh, uh, you know, uh, punishments, uh, it is likely to reduce engagement with testing. Um, so not only was a weakened package introduced, there was an extra element that was likely to undermine what had been introduced. So, uh, my, uh, so my, the point that I'm making is that uh, this is lost uh, in translation and given government wants to have effective interventions, it, it felt, gosh, if only they would come and check back and say, this is what we're going to do. Uh, what, what do you think the evidence would tell us? But hey, it's not like that. Mm, OK, thank you. Um, that, that does give us some food for thought. Um, I'd like to come to, to Anna. Anna, what's your take on this question? So um, I agree with uh, what Teresa said about the, the you need to be in the weeds for many of these issues um, because the devil is in the detail and, and that's a classic example. But I'd like to make another point. If we think about this as um, you need evidence, you need planning on the basis of that evidence, and then you need implementation. And you really need some capacity at all those levels. And I think, you know, uh, when we look around at what has happened on the evidence side of things, um, hundreds of academics, you know, stepping up and providing an awful lot of evidence on what's currently happening. And of course, we've got evidence to draw on from the past, which we can kind of bring to bear during the ep uh, epidemic or the pandemic. Um, so there is some capacity there. Um, and even in the planning, if we're thinking of, of SAGE and such like, there is some capacity to do that. But once we get into the implementation and the practical, that is where I've really seen uh, things fall apart. So, for example, in our schools report, um, it, you know, many of the high level messages clearly landed the importance of keeping schools open because of the you know, permanent damage that we would do children if we basically had them out of school for an entire year. That, that was a message, I think, that managed to cut through. But of course, we didn't say, you know, schools should be kept open irrespective. We also said schools need support to be kept open. Um, and it's, it's, I'm sure people are willing to support schools, but it's the practical that really matters. Have they got the resource? Have they got sufficient uh, you know, funds to pay for the heating so that the ventilation in schools can actually work with windows open? Um, have they got sufficient funds to pay for masks, et cetera? Um, and, and that sort of detail is where I think we're falling down often. And, and that partly reflects uh, the way we've reorganized the, the delivery of public services. So our local authorities no longer have um, any spare capacity um, and therefore, say, if you take schools, uh, a local education authority to be doing things with schools, um, now it's very difficult for them to do so. So it's that practical that we're seeing failures. Is, and, 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 and where, where was your advice sort of headed? Which bit of the Whitehall system were you sort of interfacing with? So the report um, was seen by SAGE. It was an academically grounded piece of evidence that we hoped that policymakers would take account of, and indeed, you know, they did. Um, but in that, we also had, um, if you like, one eye on what it would take for schools to 
open and remain open. Uh, so I guess you could also say we were targeting uh, the leaders that um, that sort of influence what goes on in schools. But I don't know if you're familiar with the school system, but we have now thousands of schools reporting directly to the Department for Education, not to a yeah. authority, and it's incredibly difficult mm. for me to give timely and practical mm. advice that applies in every context. Mm. Okay, th thank you. Um, and uh, Neil, what's your... Um, yeah, what's your so I, I guess... Um, I, I certainly don't envy uh, being in the decision in the place that government were. I think it's extremely difficult the way things are set up to make sensible decisions across such a range. So like you could frame any of these policy questions in like a number of ways. There's like the health incomes, effects on NHS capacity, what different groups affected, what's the ec economic impact. And each of these ways has a different form of evidence associated with it. There's sort of super complex and uncertain challenges. And you really need to bring insights together from across disciplines. And, and this is what uh, Anna was saying earlier. I, I'm not experienced, I haven't been on stage like, like David and, and, and Teresa, but it sort of strikes me that that is set up as an emergency. It's a, an emergency response to emerging science. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think it's necessarily set up uh, in such a way that allows a um, sort of coherent interpretation or perspective on the evidence to emerge in, in a balanced way, because it's convened very quickly. Um, often the questions that are being raised, there's, there's very short notice of them. So we were very explicit in setting up Delve. Um, yeah, and allow me to just step away again. I, I find it, I, I, we, can, we can all criticize government and their decisions, but I think um, the other thing we have to be very careful about is to make sure our own house is in order is in academics. And I feel very strongly um, that one of the things that's been going on is there's a difference between science and scientists. And, and if a scientist says something, that is not science. That's a scientist saying something. The process of science is an evolved process where we, oh, that's your theory. So let's see what the evidence is and let's take time um, to look at that evidence and see if it's true or not. And in, in these states of emergency, science and what scientists are saying is conflated because we don't have the time to iterate the process of science where people, I have an analogy for it that I was thinking of while watching my son play football. He's now 18. So I've been watching him play football for 14 years. And it's something very odd about watching when parents watch their children play football because they have a specific interest in the game and they can't be objective about how their child is playing or whether they should be playing. And the coach of the game also has a specific interest in the game because their child is often playing in the game. And when scientists are talking about something, that's the feeling of what's going on. Everyone has a scientific baby in the match and they are unable to sort of objectively talk about whether their baby is contributing to the victory or not. And they're even unaware of this to a large extent. And, and the reason why people like David are so important is because the referee in this is often the statistician or the public health professional who is on the ground trying to implement these policies or exactly what Anna says, what are teachers experiencing? Um, what is the NHS experiencing as a result of these things? And bringing that conversation into the scientists who are actually more concerned about their scientific theory they've been working on for a number of years is extremely difficult. And I think that it's probably apparent, and I'm speculating, that the structures we have have not allowed that sort of debate to happen to the extent we would have liked it to have happened in SAGE. And it must be, whatever I think of the current government and various policies and so on and so forth, it must be extremely difficult for them and uh, for Patrick and Chris to assimilate that evidence in such a way that the government can make good decisions based on the science when what scientists are saying is not science. It's just their current opinion about how their child is performing on the pitch and you know what that child should be doing. So I, I went on a lot there, but I'll, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Does, does anyone, thank, thank you, Neil, does anyone just want to come back on that particular point? Because I'm going to sort of open it up into a slightly bigger discussion about SAGE, but just on this specific point, that in a way, this distinction between science and scientists, does any of you, any of the other three want to come in? David, yes. You should me. Yeah, could I barge in there? Because uh, I mean, maybe we're going to come to this well, later, but- Barge away. Yeah, the, the whole business about the, um, you know, scientific disagreement in a sense. I think, I think, and Neil's point, I love the analogy of the child in the game, 
because everyone, all everyone is an advocate of their pet idea. And I, I've been throughout this. I, my pet idea is the overwhelming importance of age in terms of risk. And I've been banging on about this since March. No one's taken any notice, but I've been, you know, just not just me. But that's my pet idea. And I've been pushing it quite reasonable. So scientists always do this. You always have disagreement, everyone with their pet idea. And they are advocates of their idea to some extent. And that leads to disagreement. And, and the fact that that's being, in a way, is normally played out in private between scientists and now being played out in public can be a bit of a shock, I think, for the media and the public to see this sort of disagreement. And it's all perfectly reasonable, I think, and perfectly normal, and it's bound to happen. The problem is, is when I think the scientists become advocates of policy, in other words, what should actually be done. And that's a very different um, you know, uh, step that they've taken. And I think that um, is, is very unfortunate, in fact, that that's happened so much, is that there's an identity that, that if they, or therefore this is what should be done. Well, do you, do, you, do, you, uh, do you have an example of that, uh, David? Oh, well, I think you can see that a lot about the, you know, you might call people arguing that, that you know, we should be have much more liberal measures in terms of lockdown. We should have firmer measures in terms of we, we should be trying to reduce, you know, the two extremes, I suppose, are the, are the zero COVID perspective and the, and the more libertarian perspective, which have got, they've, they've got, um, in a way, advocates, as particularly the libertarian one, what I might consider as in the the more extreme. Although, 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 although that isn't that isn't getting that isn't feeding into policy yet, though, is it? That that, that approach. I mean, I don't. Well, see you, you could say it has been it has been considered. Um, uh, mm. Maybe it's it's not being done. But the the Barrington, you know, declaration idea definitely has been listened to. Um, uh, you know, in number ten. So you know, the, the, this has been. Um, there has been an audience for this, and this is and these are you know professional scientists with very strong views about what should be done. Um, and uh, and it is very difficult to deal with as as a scientist. I mean, who tries to communicate because everyone says, I mean, if I say, oh well, uh, you know, I, about anything about lockdown, I'm always assumed to be either pro or anti lockdown, and so I'm not. I'm not either. I'm not going to say what should be done. I refuse, and that's a quite difficult because the media just expect you to have a view. We do, uh, Anna. You had your hand up, and then Theresa, and then Neil. Yes, um, just to come back on that, I mean, I totally agree the sort of binary lockdown, not lockdown is not helpful at all. But as an educationalist, um, I think it's actually quite difficult to stay out of policy. One of the biggest criticisms we have on education research is if it's completely divorced from policy, what does it actually do? I mean, education is arguably a field, not a discipline anyway, um, but it's certainly a field of, of practical endeavour. So I do think that academics um, need to weigh up the evidence and give advice on the balance of that evidence, but being very clear, uh, you know, that ultimately they don't take the final decisions and that is a policy decision, not, not an academic one. The other thing I would just observe is that one of the hopefully good things to come out of all of this is that the public will have a better understanding that science is not right or wrong. Um, and I think that's been a real challenge all the way through that the public- Do you, do you, do you think though that the, the, the converse to that is this risk that if they see science in the way that you do, which is that it's often quite uncertain, that may actually reduce their trust or reliance on when scientists speak and say things. Well, I think we have an opportunity like we've never had before. Uh, their appetite and interest in science and data is massive at the moment. And I, I do think it is beholden on academics in particular to really hammer this point home that there's balance of evidence, there's you know, understanding of the current situation, it does change. Um, and if we can uh, obviously bring that into our school system so that children, are, uh, they are taught that and, and what that means, I think it's gonna really Im improve things long-term so we get away from this sort of, your pro-vaccines, your anti-vaccines, it's, it's really not helpful. Thank you, uh, we've got Teresa and then Neil. Yes. Um... David can say more about the work that uh, the Winton Centre has led on looking at the communication of uncertainty, which doesn't um, undermine trust. And so I think it's incredibly important that that is rehearsed. I, I want to pick up on something that Neil said in terms of the statistician as the referee. I'm sure David could think of some statisticians he wouldn't want to have as the referee, but as a general principle, I, I really like it. Um, and. I think the other thing that has uh, that, that that we've been lacking is um, very much 
a presentation of, you know, this is the direction in which we're going uh, as a policy announcement. There is uncertainty around it. So we're going to be collecting the evidence um, and we will present that and make a decision about which direction we might go in. And I think uh, the possibility of loosening up conversations so that people can learn that science is open and uncertain, mm -hmm. but the collection of evidence rather than us talking about U-turns the whole time. Um, uh, you know, sometimes there are U-turns, but I think greater use of um, statistics and uh, possibly even statisticians uh, leading us through without having skin uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the fight or dog in the race or whatever it is. Thanks. Neil, thank you. Child in the game. Um, yeah, the, the pet idea. Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I broadly agree with David, but I think it's, it's clear, I think, as Anna was also saying, that um, you start encroaching on policy and it's sort of inevitable as you as you get into the particularities of the decision. I, I was reflecting on each of the individual reports and, you know, our first report was on face masks. It was at the time when with a lot of uh, people were against face masks and we were sort of actually realizing that they were potentially a very important instrument. Um, and I think we were quite explicit. They were, we, we used language like they're an important tool in fighting the pandemic. Um, we didn't say that um, there should be fines for face masks or face masks should be obliged. We sort of said, look, it's clear that this is potentially useful. I'm, I'm thinking of Anna's report um, where, as, as she said, we, you know, the headline of the report was basically schools should be the last thing to close. Um, you know, test trace isolate where we were looking at that. I think we were doing simulations that, which are still being quoted now as we're only contacting 60%. Our simulations showed that you needed to be at 80% for this to be having any effect on the pandemic. But as, as Anna sort of says, it's interesting the extent to which, as you look at the details of our recommendations, they haven't been followed. And I don't think that that's because the government's sort of bloody minded about it. I think that if you could imagine the situation that they must be in, it's lurching from one crisis to the next in terms of what is the, the current thing that they can deal with. And I certainly feel that there seems to have been a gap in terms of missed opportunity for preparation across August for the second wave. Um, but you can also imagine that they were just exhausted from all the things they were trying to do. And I think that that's partially because it's not pervasive enough, the way this advice is entering government. I think, you know, we mentioned number 10, everyone's keen to get it in uh, the cabinet office and the treasury need to know this. Um, whereas actually what we really want, and I think if you look in situations like Germany, where I think, you know, who knows in the final judgment, but Germany's done a very good job. There's a lot of devolvement of, of these ideas to local authorities, um, which we have been able, less able to do, as Anna was implying, around uh, education, but it also applies to local health authorities. Because for a number of years, it, they, they've been, well, you're not very useful, are you? What, what things are you preventing? And of course, once every 20 years, it would have been great if you had a really good local devolved health authority that could have prevented the outbreak in the first place. I mean, I'm, I'm very struck also, um, about actually it's interesting in African countries where they're dealing with these sort of disease outbreaks um, much more often, how better equipped and easier it is to acquire the type of data you're interested in to understand the prevalence of the disease in um, today in somewhere like Uganda or Sierra Leone than it was to acquire the data about the prevalence of this disease in, in a modern evolved economy. And a lot of that is because the readiness of the pre-existing systems, which, which we of course stopped investing in because people are saying, why are we paying all this money for this thing? It doesn't seem to be delivering. So, so that sort of how we get that reaction occurring at local levels, which is what Germany really I think has done very well on. And also beyond that, my understanding from their situation is when they've had successes in one region, other regions have learned from that. I think we've gone for more of a spoken hub model where we expect Westminster to dictate everything. And, and that's extremely difficult. When you look at the outbreaks we were having- Is, is, that, is that, I mean, Neil, do you think, is that, is that, to what extent is that a function that devolution is still actually quite new in the British sort of political system? It's I, barely 20 I years suspect, old. and I'm not expert on this, but I think there's a number of different things that are coming in there. I mean, if you look at the situation, the government was already been in place for a few months. They hadn't had enough time to play with the controls, you know, the new government. In, they, in the middle of this Brexit thing, they were fighting battles around they were sort of almost, it seems to me that there was a big challenge in terms of their trust in the civil service, in terms of to deliver their agenda, in terms of the European thing. So there were a lot of issues that were rising there. So they actually started, I think if, 
what you really would need. So, so really, as well. words, if, a lot I, of trust if, between... if, if I can just translate that, so on the European thing, in the sense that you know, obviously they wanted to go for a hard Brexit, and on and on your other point, they well, they're really trying to they've been trying service. to centralize control to make the country mm. agile. In a, I mean, this is my interpretation. I'm not an expert on this, and this is me sort of speculating. They've been trying to make the country. In, and I, you know, whatever I think about their positions, what they were trying to do is get themselves in a position where they're rigorously centralizing control of the civil service such that it will do the things they want in order to deliver a Brexit efficiently. And that is almost the opposite of what you want to be happening in this environment where you want the trust to devolve down to those civil servants who are empowered to make the decisions on the ground. I mean, so I worked at Amazon for three years before I went to come to Cambridge. And one of the things that was constantly being hammered into people there was what the culture of the company was and what its priorities were. And then beyond that, you were all empowered to do the right thing on the ground because the people who are close to the problem know the right thing if they understand the culture. I think our government was in a position of saying, we don't agree with the culture that you have in this civil service because we're trying to maneuver ourselves towards these set of negotiations and reorganizing the country around a vision, a very different vision we have for the future. And that had that probably had led to a lot of trust between themselves, their ministers, and the civil servants. So that puts you in a very, very difficult position. I mean, and this is all pure speculation, but that's the run-in we had. Versus, you've got in Germany a situation where you've had the same chancellor for a number of years. Um, you know, you, you don't have that sort of thing going on. I mean, that you know, I should stop there because I've, I've, I've well, thank you. Any, well any, out any, of my uh, domain of expertise. Any, 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 uh, any thoughts or reactions to Neil before we move on to the next one? Yes, Anna. Just very briefly on that. I mean, Neil mentioned trust a number of times, and I would just say that uh, lack of trust uh, is probably an issue that predates COVID um, in many fields. And in particular, the way we um, arrange our public services has tended to be a fairly sort of accountability driven system. And as I've mentioned earlier, also highly centralized. So the devolution that we were talking about, yes, I mean, obviously we've had national devolution, but if you take, um, whether it's health or education, in, in, we've had the opposite, we've had centralization. Um, and so the, the, there is no trust between those who will be responsible for delivering something on the ground, the teacher in the classroom, for example, versus um, you know the secretary of state for education. That's a very, very big distance between them. And I think that that lack of trust has been coming home to roost because it's very, very difficult to get a big clunky system to move fast at the best of time, let alone if the various actors in it aren't actually believing in each other. So I think it's a real problem. Thank you. Uh, Theresa, very quickly, yes, please go for it. Uh, just very quickly. I think it's interesting to think about levels. So at the international level, we've got WHO that has been generating some really clear messages. Um, and at a local level, we've seen directors of public health being absolutely fantastic. And it strikes me that we've been in, in the center where there's an amount of expertise, but actually by going international and local, um, we could be far more effective. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I just want to move, can I, I just like to move on to talk, um, Let's talk about SAGE. I mean, it's been mentioned quite a number of times now already um, for those of us who are, you know, less, I guess, less into the sort of weeds of it. It's the, it's the government's, you know, kind of apex advisory group of scientists um, in uh, emergencies. It has various uh, sub uh, groups. It uh, reports into, I guess, number 10 and or the cabinet office. Um, most of the scientists who are working there seem to be volunteers, certainly from looking at it from the outside. Uh, it seems to have enormous, enormous weight and responsibility. Um, and yet, you know, I, I don't remember a situation, um, well, you've never seen a pandemic, but even a, a, just an epidemic emergency where it's, um, it's, it's become so much scrutinized that there's um, an independent, you know, in brackets, inverted commas, SAGE being led by the former uh, chief scientist, uh, David King. There's the Dell group of, you know, of the Royal Society, which is sort of also paralleling that. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, when, when the dust eventually does settle, you know, what are your reflections on how it's worked and, and how would you, if you had, you know, potentially a way to, to make it better, to reform it, what would you do? Teresa, I've got you there still on the, on the screen. You know, what, what's your 
what's your experience? You're also, of course, more at the coal face of this. Yes, um, so I'm uh, biased uh, in that I am a participant. And so um, if I didn't think it was up to much, um, I'd like to think that I would have stepped away. Um, in terms of um, how, how things might, might work better uh, in the future, I mean, one thing that uh, I, I, I would acknowledge that Delve and also through the British Academy and various other academies, they've done a fantastic job in terms of synthesizing evidence in complex areas. So we've already heard about um, education, face coverings. There's uh, another recent one on vaccinations and increasing vaccination uptake. So that's been phenomenal. Um, I, I think the secretariat uh, at SAGE has also been phenomenal. They, they, they work shifts. I mean, this is, you know, 24-7 work. Um, so I, I think what I would be adding is uh, evidence synthesis, you know, through um, machine learning, because what you've got, uh, you know, a bunch of stellar scientists um, who, who are not being paid, uh, who are doing this, um, you know, of an evening, pulling together, evidence, so to systematize the synthesis of evidence and the amount of research that's being generated, it's just impossible to keep on top of. So that's one thing that, that I would add. And I think that um, I would also uh, think for the future, do less. Um, so it's, it's phenomenal. Um, the the amount that SAGE takes on. I mean, it's, it, you know, there, there are historians, uh, uh, people, who, you know, they, they're looking at crime, they're looking at um, burials, uh, looking at uh, celebrations, large events, as well as, you know, how the virus is behaving. So I would cut it right back and stick with what seems to be core and keep coming back to what the evidence is and trying to get evaluations in real time about how well we are doing in managing the, uh, the, the transmission and how well the different policies um, that are being implemented are, are working. Theresa, just as a kind of quick follow-up, is it, is it your view that, um, that, that sufficient disciplines are represented? Because I do hear and we hear in the, in the media as well that, that SAGE is more concentrated around maybe the quantitative disciplines uh, particularly it was felt early on that it was you know very oriented towards epidemiology for example and uh, one of the reasons I think why independence age came about was because public health public health practitioners felt they didn't have a voice is, is that your view as well uh, well there are some public health uh, practitioners um, who who are participants in sage um, if, if, you, if you look at uh, where, where um, certainly in, in uh, main sage, it's, uh, they are not dominant and that voice has been late to the table. Um, in terms of qualitative work, there's qualitative expertise, certainly within SPY B. Um, but I, I think it's, it's now- that, that's, that's the behavioral, is that, is that the behavioral side? Sorry, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, but um, in SPY M, uh, well, that's the modeling group. And so that, that's, that's very- uh, well, Why is it called SPY? Is that, I mean, why is, why is it called SPY? Uh, it's great, isn't it? Um, so it's the, um, it's the uh, pand uh, 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 pandemic uh, influenza for influenza. Um, so- is it, is it like an acronym? Uh, scientific, scientific. Um, pandemic influenza subgroup oh. behavior. Um, so, it's, so, it's, so it's an acronym which everybody calls SPY. Yeah, exactly. Because Not it's understanding the irony, the irony of that. Glamorous than it actually is. So you, you've got to take the glamour where, where you can. I also uh, wonder about the size. I mean, I, David, I don't know how large um, Sage was when you were doing volcanic ash, but um, I, ca I can't believe that it was the size that it is. So, how, 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 how big is it at the moment then, if you add a, if everyone that's involved? I don't know, it's, a, it's on a website, so I would think over 100 people who participate, possibly mm -hmm. more people going in and out the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would have thought smaller groups and um, arguably, uh, you know, one might look at um, 
chairing of the whole thing by a non-specialist. I mean, I've sometimes wondered, I don't know what the term is, whether or not a female admiral uh, um, running a small group, uh, so being much more strategic, so whether there's a female admiral who, who also was a statistician, that would, might be the ideal combination. Thank you. Uh, David, let's come to you. Um, you obviously had experience before, um, you've seen how it's working now, you know, what, what, what would you change? Yeah, I think it's interesting. The um, I'd just like to make a comment about the enormous amount of essentially unpaid, highly skilled scientific work that's being done um, for the country at the moment. And I'd like to contrast that with the amount being paid to, to management consultants um, for their input into government work. So I'd just like to just mention that just in passing. Um, I think uh, Teresa made a, a very important point that you know so much effort is, is spent on essentially reviewing not very good evidence. If you look at um, uh, you know, um, you know, Sage's uh, commentary about the effectiveness of various interventions, most of them come at, uh, they've got low confidence in the evidence, maybe moderate. The only one they got high confidence on is about fa wearing face masks outdoors as a waste of time. That's about the only one they seem to have high confidence in. So I think that uh, th there is, <laughs> I think there should be a lot more evidence generation rather than just e evidence reviewing. Um, for example, I mean, and this is what something, of course, that the Royal Statistical Society has been banging on about for ages, that we've got this enormously expensive test and trace system. And yet we still don't know, you know, about, you know, people who are asked to isolate, we've got some idea about whether they're isolated. We don't know whether they actually got the virus or not. And, and it's only going to be helpful if they actually have got it and that they don't then infect someone who they would have otherwise infected. So there's a lot of informa basic information that is still not being collected. No, it only has to be done through a survey or something like that. There's a lot of evidence that what we could be collecting. And that's why, of course, and I would say this, wouldn't I? I'm a massive supporter of the ONS, you know, COVID infection survey. Just, just going out there, it's expensive, but just finding out what's going on. And it was very late to be, when it was commissioned. It moved very fast, but all through March, we had no idea what was going on in the country because there was no surveys being done. So I, I really wish that there was a lot more effort spent in evidence generation, and um, which might save having would you, to would spend you, would all you, this would you agree time. With, would you agree with Teresa's recommendation about using, in a sense, more automated methods of evidence synthesis, like machine learning? No. You wouldn't? Why, why is that? I, I wouldn't trust an inch. <laughs> I'm de I'd be deeply, deeply suspicious of something, uh, especially low, you know, there's enormous judgment required in reviewing evidence. I would not let, I would not trust a machine learning algorithm. Anyway, that, Neil might disagree. We don't want to get into that. I'm afraid I'm a I was going to say, I, I said statisticians were, no, I totally agree. I, 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 <laughs> ah, judgment, <laughs> reviewing. I said that statisticians were nice and now you say machine learning's bad. That's not fair, David. I love machine, I've worked on machine learning. It's got its place. <laughs> I know, but, I, I kind of agree. I'd be quite nervous. I, 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 I've got another interpretation, but we'll, we'll come back yeah. to that. Yeah. You Quality of evidence is incredibly important and, that, and that's been revealed in, in, in this whole. What, what, what about David, David, just coming to something else that you know, you've raised and I know others too as well is that it, again, and just as a complete outsider to all of these issues, um, it, it feels quite difficult to understand how does SAGE, so we know that there is SAGE and there is a lot of researchers and they're reviewing evidence and they're publishing papers and now we know their names and the evidence is published. But then the sort of, the, the next bit of the journey isn't clear to us as, as citizens and as viewers is, you know, where does that information go? Does it go to the cabinet office? Does it go to the Department of Education if it's about schools? Does it go to somewhere else if it's about something else? Is that, is that part of the story clearly understood? Well, it's not understood by me, so I, I don't think I'm the right person to ask. I haven't got a clue. But, but you're out there. Comment on that a bit from the. I'm not on it. I'm not on Sage. Why should I know? I, I don't even know if it's if you know on Sage Teresa, but one of the things that happened with Delve is um, I think it was kind of this odd thing at the beginning it was important that. It was a really odd thing at the beginning is that when I was trying to convene it, I immediately got in contact with Peter Diggle um, and Sylvia Richardson at the Royal Statistical Sorry, who, Society. Sorry, who, who are these? Who's Peter Diggle? So Who's Peter Diggle, I'm just about to say, they're, they're at the Royal Statistical Society, former presidents, incoming president at the Royal Statistical Society saying, Peter, Sylvia, what's going on? You must be already advising on this because, you know, we, it would be crazy if you weren't. And they're like, well, we're not. 
there isn't anything going on because there's no survey work going on in the manner that David just said. So the first sort of priority was to um, use this seat on sage in some sense that we had to bring Sylvia and Peter into the Delve group to make sure that we had the prestige that a seat on sage had for us to be able to start getting evidence out there. But all our earliest work, I think, was then, and, and Anna, I think, will back up, back me up on this, is many of the effective things we did is once that was known within government, we started interacting with Public Health England, NHS England, um, uh, the sort of uh, Department of Education, the various parts of government that had to enact these solutions and sort of say, look, this is what we think is going on. As we're building the report, we would use the report as a way of talking to the different groups and finding out what their perspectives were, seeing if we misunderstood something, so that by the time the report had come out, it had been heavily socialized by those that were supposed to enact it. Now, we know that as a result of that, some of our reports were already being used as roadmaps to do certain things, not always to the extent we wanted, but it felt very, very important to us that we were working across these different levels because it can't be enough for sort of Patrick Vallance to sort of say to Boris Johnson, this is what we think. And then the whole essence of what we're saying for Boris to go and tell someone to do it, that, that's clearly impossible. So it seems very, very important to work at those levels. And I mean, I, probably you, David hadn't quite finished, but my answer to your sort of question, I think would be that we need those channels open on a more regular basis, that it can't be this sort of single point of entry for the science to come in. There's an opportunity now to, to work for a more evidence-based evidence methods for governing the country. Many of the things we were interested in across the pandemic, what's the effect of this lockdown on the economy? Is there a better way of locking down that um, is better for the economy, um, but has uh, the same health effect? Were questions we couldn't answer real time because we were unable to measure real time things like what's the effect of this lockdown on GDP? Whereas in other countries, we were able to do that real time in Spain because we had connections with um, people in banks there that were prepared to share data with us. So we were able to watch real time the effects of interventions in Spain on their economy, while we couldn't watch the same thing within the UK. And the reason for that is because there was a lot of work done before the pandemic to enable them to do that in Spain. So the big lesson to me is, well, let's get on with doing that type of work in peacetime. So when the emergency comes, there's a large body of group of people who are used to working with government, who are experts in these areas, and who can turn their expertise onto the important questions of the day, which aren't all about new things. They're also about how are people moving on transport, things like that. So if okay. I give my answer, I just wanna, I'm hand back to David, because I, 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 I want to, I'm going to have to move us on, I'm afraid we're, I'm, I'm chairing this horrendously because I'm so over time, but I want to bring in Anna before we then move to communication. Anna, Anna, your thoughts on SAGE? Yeah, just very quickly on that. I mean, we've been talking about um, how we socialise reports with government, but I think um, what perhaps was missing in SAGE is the people who would ask the awkward questions about how things were actually going to work on the ground. And I don't think you can divorce the sort of academic consideration of both synthesis review and data generation from actually what's going to matter. Um, and I think this is sort of most obvious on basic things. I mean, for example, going back to what um, Theresa said about what's core. Well, it might seem that a certain set of issues are core, but as was evident with sick pay, sick pay turns out to be pretty core. And I'm not entirely sure everybody realized that at the beginning on test and trace. Test and trace, you can't link the person who um, has a, a, a positive test with whether or not they have children and whether or not those children are in a public school. Obviously, you need to do that in order to contain the epidemic because, you know, you need to be able to track people through schools. It's fairly obvious to someone on the ground that that's a question to ask, and that could be incorporated into your data generation. But it's not obvious necessarily to, say, academics who might be working at different levels. So I think it's having a good mixture of people in SAGE is really essential. Great, thank you. I'm going to move us on now to science communication, uh, and I wish that we had a little bit more time on this because I want to get in some questions coming in as well. But let's just start. And David, I just want to come back to you, please, if I can. Um, you know, you're probably the most vocal critic or public critic, at least, um, you know, and, and you've used phrases like number theatre to describe the uh, the Downing Street briefing. You had a, you were interviewed on the Today programme just the other day, again, about the latest round of data, which, you know, was not properly sourced and, and also out of date. Um, 
So I think I think we we kind of we know we know your we know where you stand. What would you advise them to do differently? And yeah. Oh, okay. I'll just r rattle through this quite quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love data and I love numbers and I love evidence. And so it upsets me when it's badly communicated or used in a way that seems to be far more designed to influence people's emotions and actually inform them about what's going on. I mean, I, I'll just say what I've been saying ever since I did that number theatre remark is that I really feel there needs to be a separation of the communication of the scientists and the political communication. I, I do think that that needs to be taken out of the hands of, of a political communication machine, uh, which is cl well, quite clearly what the briefings are part of. Um, so and, so uh, in, 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 in practice, would that mean that we wouldn't see um, the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer next to the prime minister? Is, is I that... I, I'm, I've been wondering about this. I wonder whether actually mm. you could get actually split the briefing so, so that you could have a, a totally separate briefing on the science Done by the by the Patrick and, and Chris with no where they choose what they're going to communicate and they are responsible for the graphs and things like that. Then there could be a, maybe some joint questioning or something like that. But the crucial thing is is that the choice and the format and the and the questions and everything should be governed by the scientists. And there is a precedent for this. I mean, I think it's a problem with all these institutions. Um, uh, Public Health England, NHS, Test and Trace. They're all operating in bunker mode. I mean, they don't get out there and communicate. Where are they on, on all the programs? Where are they on Jeremy Vine? Where are they on all, all, all this stuff? The only people who are doing it, and of course I would say this, is the Office for National Statistics, who are on Jeremy Vine, even Julia Hartley Brewer, for heaven's sakes, on talk radio, they even go on there. And they're certainly on Andrew Marr and on the Today program, of course, because they're an independent agency that's answerable to Parliament rather than number 10, rather than the Cabinet Office, and they can get out there and they do their own communications and therefore, I think, have, have enabled them to become an extremely trusted source of information. The other agencies are just bunkered down, hunkered down. They don't want to talk, they don't want to, and they, and they won't do it. Um, and I think it's deeply unfortunate that, that, that that's happening. Um, and so that's my that's my little spiel. Oh, can I just say one thing? We we have talked a lot about trust and uncertainty, and and uh, it, it, Therese has mentioned some of our work where where all our research shows that if you are sort of unapologetic about uncertainty, it does not lead to a reduction in trust in the source. And I completely believe it. And w when we talk about communication and the fact that you know this awful idea of a U-turn, can I just again and again mentioned that well regarded as the Krebs formula. John Krebs developed one, this when he was at the Food Standards Agency and just had catastrophe after crisis landing on him. There was scrapey, there was BSE, there was foot, everything came at him. And he had this formula where, where you communicated with the public. First of all, you say what you do know, and then you say what you don't know. And you're unapologetic about the fact that you don't know everything. Then you say, what you're doing about it, what you're doing to learn more. Then you tell people what they can do in the meantime. And then you say, but what we say might change. Things, we, we will change what we say. We are, have to be flexible and agile. As we learn more, we will change what we say. And, um, and he did that again and again. And right at the beginning, Chris Whitty, you could tick this off. He was doing that. He's, he's, he can be, be extremely good at, at, at talking about it. And it's such a simple formula. Ah, oh, why don't people do but, it? Is it okay? Um, all right, I'm, 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 I want to. I want to. I mean, let me bring in uh, Anna. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. Anna, what's your? Uh, you know, how would you characterize the the communication of the science and health messages? So I think one of the challenges is also we need from the beginning to realize we're in for the long term, and I think it's tempting to try and nudge behavior and influence people with a very short term message um, because it feels like a crisis mode and you want them to do X tomorrow and we want everybody to stay in. So we're gonna say X, um, but over the long term, of course, that doesn't work. Uh, what you need to do is build this trust and understanding that when you're saying things, you know, that they're believable and credible. Um, and I think that is something not deliberately, of course, but you know, that has, has happened during the course of this pandemic as people have sort of realized that some of the messages that they heard early on were rather too definitive. Um, and I think that has undermined people's faith in, well, certainly it's undermined faith in what government says, but I think it's also undermined faith in, in the idea that there are 
strategies to help ourselves get out of this. Uh, and my fear is that if it goes too far, you end up with people feeling completely fatalistic and that is not going to lead to good compliance. So it's a real issue. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Teresa. Communication, the thing that you didn't want to do, but you're now doing very well. Um, thanks. I, I absolutely agree with David about the scientists probably not being on the same platform um, as the politicians, certainly not in this particular pandemic. But while and picking up on Anna's point about um, unrealistic optimism, uh, we would of, often have uh, what I felt rather like a pantomime that, that one would have the PM being unrealistically optimistic. And there was always Chris Whitty saying, no, 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 I don't, I don't think we can say that. You know, we're, we're in this for the long haul. Um, and, 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 how, and, and do you remember how both Chris Whitty and Patrick Valence were not allowed to answer the question about Dominic Cummings? Uh, no, you and, know, th and talk, then... Talk about and then, control. Yeah. Um, but, but then they both said that they didn't want to comment um, uh, either. Um, I, th I think it's also interesting to think about the politicians because I think what they say about the science is also important. And I'm interested in the gendered nature of leadership in this pandemic. So many of uh, us will be aware of the analyses that have been done, uh, looking at the responses of, I think it's 19 female leaders out of 194 nations. And um, I, Neil and David can comment on the, the modeling uh, on the analyses that were done, but the death rates are lower in those countries. This is association, you know. Um, and the analysis of the policy response was that those uh, female leaders acted more rapidly and more decisively. And uh, it, it's also suggested, and I think that this is worthy of analysis, how some of those female leaders communicated with their populations in terms of um, engendering trust and not being overly certain. So the Norwegian, I think it's the Norwegian prime minister um, doing a question and answer session with children. Um, I, we've seen in, in New Zealand, you know, in between bath time uh, and cage bed, Jacinda Ardern sort of checking in with the, pop with the you know, with her population on, on um, Facebook. So I, I think that that is, worth looking at where the communication by politicians has engendered trust and how they've been able to communicate the science in a way that people have been able to trust in the science. So, so Teresa, just very kind of briefly following up, in, in the early days of the pandemic, you know, members of SAGE uh, you know, were more reluctant to, to come out and speak. And of course, you've yourself articulated, you know, well, your reasons. Um, what can what would change your mind because you know the, you're clearly you know very articulate i'm following as a non-specialist you know what what you're saying you know your voice would be really powerful if it was out there you know what 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 could we say to you to help you to persuade you to change your mind i i um i think being able to communicate uh with other scientists, I do feel that the daily press briefings, which did turn into a uh, number theater, as, as David uh, so memorably described it, were a missed opportunity. They were a real missed opportunity to bring many different people uh, to come and talk about the evidence. And if I, I have to say, I'm, I'm not dodging the bullet. If I were asked to do that, um, then I would I would do it. I would see. Well, there we go. There's there's an open invitation if someone's listening or someone's watching. Thank thank you thank you so much, Neil. Just finally on on communication. Yeah, I, th I think it's very difficult. Um, I think uh, David's expressed a lot of it better than I would about sort of frustration with the way that some scientists or maybe it was Teresa have, have veered from their domain of expertise to their personal opinion, and. You know, it, there's enormous, it's fascinating, right? Because so as I worked for three years for Amazon, I, I did press interviews, you get press training um, and you, you start understanding that you're, as much as your ego 
you know, a lot of people, a lot of men, unfortunately, Teresa, have an ego first approach to these things. And uh, which, 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 mean, which, mean, which means that they're, that they're sort of, of course, it's me here talking because I'm brilliant. And, uh, and now I want to show how brilliant I am. Whereas actually you're representing an organization and you're representing science in some sense, if you're speaking as a scientist. So I greatly admire both Teresa and David's approach to this for the same reason that David is doing what his job is, which is to sort of help uh, the public understand uncertainty. And Teresa is also doing what her job is, which is to give the best advice she can and not undermine that advice after the event. The unfortunate thing is there are many people that don't um, follow uh, their practice. And I almost don't trust myself to do it sometimes. I think I'm quite a good communicator, but I worry if I'm in front of the press, do I get carried away with my opinion? Yeah. David. Um, David wants to come in, then I've got one. Yeah. For you, Sorry, Neil. can I just butt in and say, yeah, yeah, Neil, I can understand you and Teresa being reluctant to do this because it can be nasty dealing with the with the, with the media. But I, I am really sorry that not more what I regard as unaligned, non-aligned scientists haven't been out there just explaining things to people, which is what I try to do. I mean, I can you can I mean, I've tried to learn some tricks not to be pushed into one way, and I always I still get it wrong. But actually, it's been a good time to engage with the media because it's a seller's market. They really want you. And uh, I sh you know, and when I'm stitched up, or, you know, have been or get badly quoted or something, I complain. I've got headlines changed. I get all sorts of stuff done. They really want you. And so it, David, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be just agree. me doing this. I, it's not, I know it's not just me but doing it, but I, I wish it should about, be 100 me's. What, what I worried about in this case is I happen to be involved in an organization that I felt was a was deploying important advice. So I do engage regularly on machine learning yeah. with the media, but I happen to be, and I felt if on Tuesday, yeah. I, I've been quoted in the press for saying something, and on Wednesday, I'm in a meeting with someone we're trying to influence and persuade of a particular point of view, yeah. and that person's under pressure because it's, you know, everyone who's making decisions is under terrible pressure, and they're not in their best frame of mind for accepting the balance of evidence. Anything I may have said, on the day before. I often, you know, I cringed whenever Independent Sage said something sensible because I thought, oh my God, now it's going to be difficult to persuade the government of the sensible thing that Independent Sage has said because they're almost going to want to not yeah. act yeah. on those things. And yeah. I think, you know, what are, what are we doing this for? Is Independent Sage, is it theatre, is it science theatre? Because I get why they wanted to do it. I bet get people were upset with Sage and so on and so forth. But what was the point? What, and, and it's sort of surprising when you've got an ex-chief scientific advisor convening it, because it's sort of like, do they really think that a government that's under pressure and has all this political thing is going to respond happily to these new recommendations <laughs> from this rival body? Um, Anna, yeah. <clears throat> Anna you, you wanted to just come in on that point, I guess, yep. Yeah, I totally agree with Neil. And, and, and one model we can go for is something like the SRC Economics of the Observatory. So those are short pieces. Uh, they're collaboratively written and reviewed by the community. And yes, it's not the same as being on telly, but actually it allows policymakers to engage with the material in a bit more of a neutral way. And they are uh, being well read. So I know that the passive approach doesn't always work. And people say people don't have time to read, except when it's short, snappy, and to the point, um, I think you can get more traction than making a big political deal of it, because as David said, they're just not going to listen. Independent Sage are not here, uh, so I'm sure that uh, if they were, they would be able, they'd want to respond to some of the things. I, I'm not going to uh, obviously speak for them right now, but maybe there's an opportunity in a follow-up event, you know, if the Bennett Institute considered it, to have somebody from them uh, represented too. I want to go straight to the questions now. Um, and actually, I just want to come back to you, Neil, because one of them that just came in and just really uh, jumping off your experience working for a, a large company, um, you know, co companies tend to have very centralized communications. And in a way, the number 10 um, uh, system is going to be headed that way soon because we're going to be seeing a, um, a more formal um, briefing uh, from Downing Street in the way that we do from the White House. Um, do you think the government, you know, that, that we need a chief communications officer alongside the chief scientific officer and the chief medical officer? I, I suppose that's a, I mean, that's a decision for them. I wouldn't want to 
I mean, I, I think the tension is if you're in a large organization, you, you never get. So the, the really interesting thing about Amazon, let, let, let me put it, is that it tries to be this devolved group where there's a lot of independence sort of autonomy of action um, by individuals at the lowest levels. And that can apply for a large number of things. Um, and I mean, it, it, it's sort of a devolved autonomy um, or sometimes in, in the company, I did hear someone refer to it as organized chaos. It's very effective in moving quickly and responding to changing circumstances. It does not work for communication. There were a number of different areas where that did not apply. Um, I mean, it, it, people didn't explicitly say this, but this is just what I noticed. Uh, one of those would be PR because brand is absolutely vital. Any action that someone takes to diminish the brand overall and the government's in that position. Other areas were legal. Other areas were things like HR. There's some things where you just cannot do that. Um, so this sort of devolved local autonomy thing sometimes, and I, I don't know what the right uh, strategy is. They've got all sorts of problems. One of the advantages we had in Dell um, was that we could have open discussions amongst difference of experts, sharing differences of opinions without fear that those discussions were gonna appear in the press the next day as this is what government is thinking. And it, I reflected several times on how difficult it is for government to have that type of open discussion we'd love them to be having, because once it appears as a leak, it, it undermines the entire discussion. So I, I don't know, it's it just a horribly complex job whenever I thought about it, and I'm not sure how they should best do it. <clears throat> okay, um, we've got a little over 10 minutes, so um, I'm gonna quickly rifle through the questions and the way I'll do this, I'm just gonna put each question to one of you rather than everyone. And that way, hopefully, more of the questions can, can get a bit of a look in. So this one's from Rich Green. Um, this, David, let's, let's see if you want to have a go at this. To what extent should scientists advising policymakers anticipate the values of decision makers? Oh, I don't know why that's for me. Um, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, no, I, I yeah, that's very interesting, but because I do think that you know, on the whole, we're, we're talking about evidence, you know, synthesizing evidence, uh, which is, I hate to use this word, about facts or, or about science or about, you know, our, our understanding of how the world works. Obviously, um, the, uh, the behavior, you know, as Teresa would say, you know, part of that evidence is towards about, you know, people's behavior, behavioral, and, uh, and that's an absolutely essential part of, of the sort of scientific advice. It seems to me that um, while you could report on uh, people's values and what they thought was important in society, and that is a piece of evidence that would could contribute to the to the decision, um, I you know I don't I'm not a big fan of the of you know trying to use some formal decision theory method for optimization of the happiness of the nation or whatever um, uh, by the scientists themselves. In the end. I kind of think that the synthesis of the evidence, which was re being received from different sources about what the scientific evidence is, about what we know about people's behavior, or <clears throat> what we know about people's values, which is uh, absolutely an essential part of any, any decision. In the end, that's a political decision. And I don't think that's a scientific decision. Unless we have a complete technocracy. Thank you. Thank you, David. This, uh, this, well, this question comes from Louis Coiffe from the Open Innovation Team. Is it fair to ask science experts to take a view about what should be done, Anna? I think it's perfectly sensible to ask academics and science experts um, what the evidence would suggest is the right course of action. Um, I mean, you know, we're here to do many things, including Blue Skies research, but I mean, ultimately, uh, if what we have to say isn't useful to inform the debate, then I kind of think, what are we here for? Um, that's not the same as taking the decision. And I think those two things are distinct. And in, in the light of the sort of previous question about values, um, remember, I guess, that all the questions we ask are fairly driven by our values. What we're interested in tends to be driven by our values. So I do, do think it pays to, to think long and hard about what questions we really need to answer. It goes back to Teresa's point about what is core here? Um, because there are things to do, particularly with the economy and social relationships and families that are actually as core as the epidemiology. And we need to remember that. Great, thank you. This one's from Colin Wilson from an organization that I, that I wish we did hear more from, the Government Actuaries Department. And uh, Colin asks, would it make for a better discussion about policy options to talk about short-term impacts versus long-term impacts instead of health 
versus economic impacts. Um, Neil, you're nodding. Do you want to take that on? It, it was actually, it fascinates me because it relates to something that used to come up a lot. So I was once asked afterwards, oh, so what price do you put on customer satisfaction in Amazon? You don't put a price on customer satisfaction. It's balanced against you've got a short term offset, like the customer's disappointed that something's in stock versus there's a long term issue that if you stock everything, the prices go up. So you, it cancels out. And there's, there's something I think, I mean, I'm being a bit oversimplistic there, but I would totally agree with that. That long term versus short term trade off is very often the key trade off. And then there's lots of interesting difficulties because the long term outcomes are often less certain than the short term outcomes. And so it's the short term horizon uncertainty versus the long term horizon uncertainty that you're actually trading off. It's not trading money off versus health or lives or something else like this. Um, it, 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 you know. It, it's phrased in the wrong way. I very much agree with that. And, you know, lovely actuaries, ONS, you know, I just want to back what, you know, before this crisis, we're running around talking about AI all the time, right? And then in the middle of the crisis, oh, suddenly the ONS turns out to be quite significant, you know, and the actuaries turn out to know what they're doing and all these other things are important. Super, thanks for that great question. I totally agree. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Neil. So this next one's from John Morgan. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Um, the cynical observer may criticize a political group for drawing up tactics or strategy around soundbite preparedness. I'm not sure why this is going, but I don't know, maybe you will. Would the panel agree that such a shallow preparation is less likely to succeed in a fast moving situation? Any volunteers for that one? No. Okay, that's it. We're going to move on. Um, John, hopefully you could maybe you could send that in by email. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Here's another one coming in from Lindsay Pike. Building in on Neil's distinction between science and scientists, to what extent is academic expertise valued versus sharing specific research findings? Neil. Does, does that mean in terms of like a considered opinion from an academic? I would guess so, yeah. It's unfortunate. Um, or, and I guess, can I reconvert the question to should it be valued? Um, yeah. I, th I think this relates to, um, I like Teresa's uh, female admiral figure, who's also a statistician, um, who is, if it's being chaired by that imagined figure, I think it works really well. Where it works very badly is, um, there's a horrible tendency amongst scientists to um, project some very unscientific characteristics, which is to use their authority or their experience to dominate someone else's opinion. And academic expertise, when it's framed correctly and the environment is right and it's being shared in a, in a negotiated way is extremely valuable. But when one academic's expertise based on their prestige and their history is dominating someone else's knowledge, who may very often be a public health expert who's been on the ground and seen the effect of these policies. It's extremely damaging. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna, and I'm, I'm really sorry to all the participants because the questions really started coming in towards the end. And, um, and maybe this is a, you know, the space for a follow-up. I just wanna give each of you just a quick minute to um, uh, just for any kind of final thoughts. And, and I will actually just, uh, you know, just sort of throw one more question in, which is coming from quite a few people, which is that considering, uh, I'm, I'm sort of really paraphrasing, I probably not very well, but just considering the pressure that so many researchers and scientists are under, you know, is it any sort of surprise that, you know, they, that in a way, this is not a great advertisement for public engagement or for, public science communication because you're just coming you're, you're being coming at it from all so many directions from um you know from the press from politicians from you know local government from the kind of international space so this is clearly a lot of pressure and when we normally talk about public engagement it's in a it's in a much less febrile environment and so is there something to be said for you know in a way for Teresa's view that you know, it's it's better to disengage but anyway Final, that's just something that's come in from the questions. Any other quick closing thoughts in the few last few minutes we have? David, starting with you. Yeah, I'd like to answer that because it does summarize my final thoughts. I, I've got every sympathy with, with um, you know, people, unlike me, who have been working their watts it's on <clears> for, for months, all year. Why should I also have to deal with the media? Um, and yet, 
I also have got the point that, that there's an enormous need for what am I, you know, as I said, non-aligned scientists to help the media. And there's an enormous appetite for it, the demand. And then I wouldn't get asked so often. So I, I really think that's, and, and so I, I, I think the scientific community, especially the teams, everyone's working in teams, has to be, they've got to nominate someone. They've got to find somebody who is willing, who is knowledgeable and senior and is trained on all the media training, who is willing to get out there and act as the spokesperson or whatever for that group of researchers. I, I think it's an essential role and I, I, it's to one to be valued and to be uh, respected. I think it's very important indeed. I, and frankly, if the Office for National Statistics can do it and put their researchers out, their, their team leaders out onto Jeremy Vine's show, I don't see why a group of scientists, uh, any of these places doing this fantastic work can't also find one person to be trained and that that is their job and that is a highly respected role. I do feel that this whole crisis has shown that, you know, the scientific communication to the general public is of inestimable value. And, uh, and, I, 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 um, and I hope that these lessons can be learned. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just looking across my screen. So Neil, final minute. Um, well, I just want to actually, so I think one thing that I found invaluable, so is um, greater interaction with policy. So I was very lucky to sort of, because of machine learning being high in people's minds to end up working with the Center for Science and Policy quite some years ago and start doing some policy work and engaging with civil servants. Is, is, is this the one at, at Cambridge University? It's the Cambridge one, yeah. Um, Rob Doubleday leads, which has been set up, I think, by previous people who've experienced this, like Frank Kelly, um, saying that we need to get scientists to better understand this. So I'd like to make the mirroring call that David's made that actually initiatives like that, that was immensely valuable for me to arrive in this, these circumstances with, with some understanding of the pressures ministers, civil servants and other people are under. And then, so it's therefore some understanding of, of what I could do that would help and, and what I wouldn't. So I'll, I'll mirror that call that, that David's made for media, which I agree with, although in this particular case, I've stepped away from that, but also that sort of engagement with policy and, and, and government in, in peacetime so that we can do it well, as, as I'm sure Anna also you know, knows how to do um, in, in, in the emergency. Lovely, thank you so much. Um, Teresa, closing thoughts. Um, I, I want to come back to a comment that David made about the, um, not his words, but the missed opportunity for collecting badly needed evidence. And one, one of the, and going back to an earlier question about changes at, at SAGE, I don't know if it would be at that level, um, that we've got well-developed uh, well structures for evaluating uh, pharm pharmacological, pharmaceutical interventions, so uh, the vaccines, um, and yet for what are known as the NPIs, the non-pharmaceutical -pharma interventions, which are the behavioral ones, we don't have an evaluation or a research framework that's being routinely used. And yet we've seen, David's already mentioned Test Trace and Isolate. Uh, I want to mention Operation Moonshot. Um, so huge amounts of public money being invested in what I would call novel technologies uh, which means that they have the potential for benefit, but also potential for harm. And we don't know the nature or scale of those. So what I would want to see is uh, frameworks coming out of this. I don't know whether you would you do it in terms of the amount of money that's being invested, um, but they need to be part of uh, an independent evaluation with the evidence fed back into the system. Great stuff. Thank you so much. There's a thumbs up from, from uh, coming from speakers. And uh, last but not least, uh, Anna. Thank you. I mean, I do engage with the media, not as frequently or as effectively as David. Um, but my reflections when I do so is that it would be really helpful to have some of those interdisciplinary discussions carried out in public so that the public can get a better appreciation of the nuances and the challenges and the tensions when we're trying to deal with an issue which has so many different facets. And let's face it, policies that pull in one direction you know, can be damaging in another. And some of that's going on behind closed doors um, and the politicians are in a very difficult space because they seem reluctant to acknowledge all of those tensions. 
And I think that is a role for academics and indeed people who are charged with delivering this stuff on the ground to really get stuck in and say, okay, how complicated is this? And how do we move from crisis stage to uh, managing this over the slightly longer term? Anna, thank you so very much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, um, to Teresa, to David, to Neil, all of the University of Cambridge. Thank you to the, the Bennett Institute for putting on this, um, this event. I think we could easily have gone on for another half hour, probably longer, and hopefully there's, um, there's a lot of scope for a follow-up event because I think there's plenty of scope to, to really uh, drill down deeper into some of the issues. I, I, I really felt that we were really only scratching the surface. Um, for more news and events, please visit the Bennett Institute website, which is bennettinstitute.cam.ac.uk, follow them on Twitter. There is also the Bennett Prospect Prize, which is an opportunity for early career researchers and policy professionals to answer a pressing policy question for the chance to win £10,000, and that will be published by the Bennett Institute and by Prospect Magazine. Again, details on the website. Just leaves me to say thank you again, everybody, for joining. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I've learned much, much more uh, than I than I knew when I came, and I hope to be able to join you again um, in the future. Thank you so much, and good evening.